Okay, so I'm going to talk about separation of variables, which is an integration technique when there's more than one variable. So we've already talked about how to solve differential equations. So if I look at this one example, we've learned both how to solve differential equations for either a general solution where we have the plus C, or for some particular solution where we actually figure out what C is. So if I just do a little bit of um, review on this one example, if I were trying to solve for the general solution to this differential equation, I know that I could figure out what y is by integrating y prime, which would look like y equals the integral of 3x squared minus 2x, giving me y equals 3 times 1 third x cubed minus 2 times 1 half x squared plus c. That would be my general solution. If for part B I were asked to find the particular solution and I know that f of 1 equals 4, that's telling me if x is 1, y is 4. So I'm going to go ahead and plug that into my uh, general solution and use it to solve for c. So 4 equals 1 cubed minus 1 plus c, meaning 4 equals c, and my particular solution would then be y equals x cubed minus x squared plus 4, because I remember to go back and put the four or put the C into my equation. So now we want to look at what if I'm trying to solve a differential equation and it has uh, more than one variable. So if I look at this next example here, these next couple examples, so notice if I'm asked to solve the differential equation dy dx equals negative x over y, that's the same thing as being asked to solve y prime equals negative x over y. Well, that would then tell me what I needed to do was integrate y prime with, well, actually, let me go back. So based on what we've known so far then, that would tell me that y equals the integral of negative x over y dx. The problem that I run into now is I have this y, but I'm integrating with respect to x, so that doesn't make sense. Well, that's why we have to have this idea of separation of variables. Separation of variables is a way that we can get variables on the same side and then rather try to figure out a way to integrate with two different variables, we'll just integrate both sides of our equation. So let's say I go back to this same example that I was struggling with up here, this dy dx equals negative x over y. So going ahead to get like variables on the same side, I'm essentially going to cross multiply, giving me y times dy equals negative x times dx. And now I can integrate each side and I don't have that issue of having too many different variables. Well, I know that y integrates to be 1 half y squared plus some c. I'm going to call it c1 and you'll see why in a moment. Over here, if I integrate negative x, I know that becomes negative 1 half x squared this is also plus C, which is why I said plus C1 on the left. So I'm going to say plus C2 on the right to show it's some other constant. Well, if these C's just represent some random constant, some random number, couldn't I subtract random number from other random number? And isn't it going to give me another just random number? Say I call it C. So 1 half Y squared equals negative 1 half x squared plus some constant that I got from putting together two other constants. So typically when we look at these types of problems, what we're going to want to do is try to get y by itself because just like in the previous example, my general solution had y by itself. Um, but only because I can, um, I can see what kind of an equation this is going to turn into. I'm going to on this one go ahead and multiply both sides by 2. So I'm going to come up here because I'm running out of room, giving me y squared equals negative x squared plus, if I multiply a constant by 2, I still get some constant back. So notice that regardless of what I'm doing to manipulate my equation, it's not really affecting my c. I'm going to go ahead and add x squared to both sides. Like I said, typically I would try to get y by itself, but notice that by putting both x squared and y squared on the same side, I get the equation of a circle with a radius of c or I guess a radius of the square root of c, and with a center of 0, 0. So this here is the derivative of my circle formula. So this would be um, the 
essentially the formula to find the slope of my circle with some given radius c. If we continue to look at some examples with separation of variables, continuing to use this same method, let's say for example I'm asked to solve um, y prime equals 3x squared over y. I think it is much easier if I turn dy prime into dy dx to begin with because I'm going to anticipate already that I'm going to have to use separation of variables and get my like terms on the same side. Cross multiplying, I am going to get y times dy equals 3x squared times dx. From here I can go ahead and integrate both sides, giving me the integral of y dy equals the integral of 3x squared dx. Integrating y, I get 1 half y squared plus some constant. As I saw in the last example, I'm only going to have a constant on one side in the end anyway. So I'm going to go ahead and hold off putting a plus c here because I'm anticipating the fact that I'm just going to move it over here. Giving me uh, x to the third and then there's my constant. If I wanted to solve this to figure out what y was, I could multiply both sides by 2, giving me y squared equals 2x cubed. Again, multiplying a constant by 2 still gives me another constant. I can take the square root of each side, remembering my plus or minus, and this would be considered the general solution to my equation. Also, um, actually, yeah, I will leave it like that. So this would be my general solution because it has that plus c as opposed to having a particular solution. If I look at another example, this one a little bit more on the difficult side, not quite as basic. What if I'm asking to find the general solution to uh, dh over dt equals negative k times h minus 20? Well, I see that I have two different variables, an h and a t here. But on this side, I only have an h, and then I have some random k. So let's talk about what k is. If you remember back to previous math courses, at some point we learned how to find uh, equations for direct variation. And we said direct variation meant um, that it would be in the form y equals kx, where k stood for our constant of variation. It was basically a fancy word for saying it was our slope. But what it meant that was that they were in proportion with one another, in direct proportion with one another. So I know that this k is always just going to stand for some constant, some constant of variation, some number, some slope. So knowing that, I'm going to go ahead and try to get my h over here with my h. And I'm just going to go ahead and let my number hang out with my dt because I don't have any other t's. So I could distribute. But I think it would just be easier to divide both sides by h minus 20 and take out that extra step, giving me dh over h minus 20, which is the same thing as 1 over h minus 20, dh. If I multiply both sides by dt, that leaves me with dk, or excuse me, k dt. And now I can go ahead and integrate each side giving me the integral of 1 over h minus 20 dh equals the integral of negative k dt. Well, this right side is pretty basic. If this stands for just some constant, I'm going to end up integrating and getting negative kt plus c. Over here, however, I realize I'm going to have to use some u substitution because if I make h minus 20 u, I'll have 1 over u, which I know is just going to give me ln. So I'm going to go ahead and try that. Then du dh would just be 1. So du would be dh, which is nice because now all I have to do is substitute u in for h minus 20, du in for dh, giving me the integral of 1 over u du equals, I already talked about how I already know how to integrate this, so I'm going to go ahead and do it negative kt plus c, which gives me ln of absolute value of u. Well, I know that u was h minus 20, so I'm going to go ahead and stick that back in. I should say plus c, but I know I'm only going to end up with a constant on one side anyway. So I'm going to go ahead and leave it like that. Now, just like before, I wanted to solve for y. Now I want to solve for 
my H. Because remember, DH, DT is the same thing as H prime. So if I know H prime and I'm trying to find the solution to my H prime equation, I'm trying to figure out what is H. So if I want to try to get H by itself in the solution that I just got, I need to think back to previous courses where I learned how to change something from logarithmic form to exponential form. Well, I know that my base for ln is e, so I'll have e to the negative kt plus c equals absolute value of h minus 20. Well, I'm going to notice a couple things here. I'm going to notice that this is an exponential function, and I know my exponential growth functions or my exponential decay functions, I guess um, more than likely because it's negative, but either way, they're always positive. So that tells me I can go ahead and get rid of my absolute value bars. I know they're always positive because if you think about what does the graph look like, they look like this. This isn't a very good graph, sorry. But they look something like that. Um, so I know that this is always going to be positive. I also know that when I'm adding my exponents, I can unadd them by multiplying same bases. Um, basically what I'm saying is I'm going, I can say that a to the m plus n got that way because I originally had a to the m, a to the n. So basically kind of going backward from one of, backwards from one of our exponential formulas or exponential rules. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. So I'm going to have e to the negative kt times e to the c equals h minus 20. Well, if I remember that this is just some constant, just some number, e raised to some number is some other number. So I could even call this expression here c once again. So if I call that c again, I'll have e to the negative kt times some constant. Well, couldn't I pull my constant out front saying c times e to the negative kt? And if my goal was to get h by itself, couldn't I add 20 to each side? therefore giving me h by itself. Looking at one more example, suppose now I'm asked to find the particular solution. So we found a couple general solutions where we had that c to dp dt equals 2p minus 2pt. If we're told we have an initial condition of p, um, p of 0 equals 5. So I can use this to find my part, uh, particular solution just like I did in the beginning in that review problem. So remember, just like in the beginning, I first have to find my uh, general solution. So I'm going to go ahead and do that just like I've done before. So I'm going to go ahead and say dp dt is equal to, now I can factor. Um, if I want to, I could factor out a 2p because I know I'm going to want to get my p's on one side and my t's on the other side. And watch what happens if I do. It gives me 1 minus t. And then I can um, go ahead and multiply by dt and divide by 2p, giving me 1 over 2p dp equals 1 minus t dt. Thinking ahead just a little bit, I see that I'm going to have to use u substitution in order to integrate this. But if I did not have that 2, I wouldn't have to use u substitution. I could just say 1 over p integrates to be ln absolute value of p. 1 minus t is very easy to integrate because it's just a polynomial. If it were 2 minus 2t, two it would be just as easy. So I'm going to go back where I factored right here. And instead of factoring out a 2p, I'm going to go ahead and factor out just a p, giving me dp dt equals p times 2 minus 2t. Two Once again, I'm going to get the p's on one side and the t's on the other, giving me 1 over p dp equals 2 minus 2t two dt. And now my integrating is going to be a lot easier. So integrating, um, and I'm going to go ahead and I know I'll run out of room if I don't do this. I'm going to move back over here. I'm going to have the integral of 1 over p dp equals the integral of 2 minus 2t dt. Well, as I talked about before, I know that 1 over p integrates to be ln absolute value of p, which then also integrates, uh, the right side also integrates to be 2t minus t squared, and I'm again just going to put the c on one side, 
So because I had dp over dt, which was the same thing as p prime, I know that I should have been solving for p. So if I want to try to solve for p, just like I did in the last one, I'm going to go ahead and try to change this to exponential form. When I change it to exponential form, I get e to the 2t minus t squared plus c equals absolute value of p. It is exponential, so I do not need the absolute value bars. Once again, I could separate these. I'm okay leaving these together. I am going to separate this off um, and say it's e to the 2t minus t squared times e to the c. Again, because I'm going to anticipate that that will then just break down to be some constant that I can multiply out front. So going ahead and doing that, I will have, and I'm actually going to leave that room to find my particular solution, I will have e to the 2t minus t squared, e to the c equals p. I know e to the c is just some constant, so I will have c, e to the 2t minus t squared equals p. There would be my general solution. Now I want to find my particular solution. Well, in order to find my particular solution, I'm going to take into account that p of 0 equals 5. So because I dealt with p's and t's instead of x's and y's, I'm going to say when t was 0, p was 5. I'm going to plug that into my general solution, giving me c times e to the 2 times 0 minus 0 squared equals 5. Well, that's just going to be e to the 0. And remember, anything raised to the 0 power is just 1. So I end up with c equals 5. And my particular solution is 5 e to the 2t minus t squared equals p. So now I'm going to point out a formula to you and a shortcut that you can use on some but not all um, a separation of variable type integration problems. So this formula, because notice we're seeing similar results. The number, the last the example 5 and example 4 were very similar in our final answers involving some constant times e raised to some power was, oops, what we wanted. Um, I guess that's going to move with me. Let's see if I can, there we go. <laughs> um, so, um, because the differential equation dy dx equals ky shows up in so many applications, because we have direct variation happening all the time, we have a formula. So, the formula that we have is dy dx equals ky, that is just going to um, y prime, the solution to y prime equals ky, so where our, um, our y is in proportion to our, to our rate of y, is going to be y equals c times e to the kx, where c is again just some constant, just some number. So I want to re-look at that example 5 that we just looked at. What if I had noticed that after factoring out the p, I was left with 2 minus 2t. Two well, then this would have been my, my y in essence, right? This is my, my variable, so I have y prime, and then I have y. I have p prime, and I have p, p prime and p, so making this then my k. Well, then my formula would have been P equals C E to the K, which is 2, well, let's see, I'll write my, yeah, 2 minus 2T, two so there's my K, times X, following just this right here. But notice my X in this equation was actually T, so times T, giving me P equals C E, distributing the T in, 2t minus 2t squared. Isn't that what I got? Now, I would still have to go through the work to find the particular solution, but it is a nice shortcut to finding the general solution if it is in the form dy dx, so y prime, equals some constant times my y variable.